Welcome to another broadcast of the Lorain County Commissioner's General Meeting. Unless otherwise announced, meetings are held Thursday mornings at 9.30 at the Lorain County Administration Building, 226 Middle Avenue, 4th Floor, Downtown Elyria. These are public meetings, and as always, you are invited to attend. Let's stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. morning everyone today we uh, are featuring a Doberman male about a year and a half old uh, he's available is he available now Saturday. Saturday and he's in cage nine he's very very calm very nice looking dog um, come down to our dog kennel and see if there's a dog out, uh, that we have that would meet your needs maybe small maybe big but he's a very nice dog so we're still batting a thousand come on pick up the dog I think he wants to stay here Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Lorain County Commissioner's meeting. Today is April 20th. Uh, our thought for the day, it's been proven folks who have no voices or vices have very few virtues. Read it again. It's been proven folks who have no vices have very few virtues. Say that five times fast. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Uh, 930 which we're a little running a little late today we have a proclamation which I will read in the manner of recognizing National Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness for the month of April 2006 in Lorain County Ohio whereas Lorain County pr prides itself on giving back to the community contributing to the quality of life among our citizens providing a safe and enjoyable place to nurture children and raise families and whereas Voices for Children holds an annual rally for kids at Westfield Shopping Mall, which is one of several awarenesses and education activities across the county in April to recognize National, Abuse, National Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month. This will be the fourth annual rally to be held on April 22, 2006. And whereas more than 440 children in Lorain County suffer from some form of abuse, or neglect each year. And whereas many Lorain County organizations and agencies have come together to make the public aware of the great services available to children and families in our county. And whereas through a local effort, our government, schools, churches, and local organizations must work together to ensure that every child has a safe has a chance for a safe and positive future. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Lorain County Board of Commissioners that we hereby recognize National Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness for the month of April 2006 in Lorain County and encourage all citizens to join in its efforts to ensure every child has a chance for a safe and positive future free from abuse and neglect. Signed by Lori Kukowski, Ted Kahlo, and Betty Blair. Is anyone here that would like to accept this? Voices for Children, we, we thank you and we would like to give each one of the commissioners one of our little logos. There you go. And uh, this is Sister Mary Berrigan who this is in Mary. on our board and she would like to make a statement. Please do. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, commissioners. Where's we just, um, Barb and I. Where's your dog? Well, <laughs> I was afraid somebody would want to adopt him, Probably. so I left him at home, you know. <laughs> I took him to the groomer yesterday and they threatened to kidnap him, so I'm a little leery. Um, 
Barb and I represent the Voices for Children program. Both of us are board members and also guardian ad litem. And um, we appreciate very much your support of the program and the efforts of really all of the agencies in the county that do support children and families. Um, as mentioned, we do have our rally event coming up. It's actually this Saturday at the mall. Um, my dog will be there, actually. Um, but we also have a lot of entertainment. We have almost 40 organizations from Lorain County that will be there with information, activities, and um, opportunities for people to find out more about them and also to uh, get some information for their families. So we um, thank you very much for your support of us. We will have the proclamation with us at the mall, and then it will be in the Voices for Children office. So thank you very much. Thank you, sister. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Barb. Okay, we have another uh, proclamation for Government Week. In the matter of proclaiming the week of April 23rd through 29th as National County Government Week in Lorain County, Ohio. Whereas counties promote, preserve, and protect their county communities nationwide, and whereas regionalism has become a mo modern mantra invoked to engage the economies and efficiencies of scale in pursuit of enhanced quality of life through cooperation across boundaries among and between cities, villages, suburbs, and townships. And whereas county government in Ohio and across America is a long accepted, long effective implementation phase phrase for regionalism. Ohio's 88 county communities provide stability and effective and effective first response to our citizens, breathing life to the concept of regionalism. And whereas counties like Lorain County provide essential services to make our communities, our regions stronger, safer, and more effective. From the commissioners and the administrator through the judges, prosecutor, recorder, treasurer, <coughs> coroner, engineer, and sheriff, and others not listed, day-to-day -day life goes on, rights are protected, and businesses get done by and through county government. And whereas in recognition of the leadership, innovation, diligence, and valuable service provided by our nation's counties, and calling upon all elected or appointed officials within the boundaries of Lorain County and the state of Ohio to join with us. Now, therefore, be resolved by the Lorain County Board of Commissioners. We hereby pro proclaim the week of April 23rd through the 29th as National <coughs> County Government Week in Lorain County. Signed by Lori Kukowski, Ted Kahlo, and Betty Blair. Uh, Larry Allen, do you want to come up and say a few words? As has been stated that the 23rd through the 28th, will, uh, 29th, I'm sorry, is government week. We're going to have and we would ask the community to come out and uh, be a part of our local regional government day here at the uh, administration building, April the 28th, uh, 2006, from 9 to 4 p.m., whereby all the county offices are going to be open and there are going to be um, many uh, features for you. We'll have a welcoming address by the commissioners, then a presentation by the county recorder. Uh, the sheriff's department is going to do uh, identity theft um, uh, prevention uh, presentation, and the county prosecutor will be giving a presentation. There will be tours of the different offices, and also tours on the uh, Lorraine, Trans Lorraine County Transit out to our 911 uh, location, emergency management location, and to our co county dog kennel. So we're asking you to come uh, next Friday from 9 to uh, 4 p.m. and uh, see how your government is working. Thank you, Larry. Okay, we're down to resolutions. Okay. Job and family services bills. So moved. Second. <clears throat> Any discussion? Ms. Kate, <coughs> excuse me, Ms. Kakowski? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Okay. Investments? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Kakowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. Okay. Appropriation? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Kakowski? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Transfers? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Kakowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Mr. Kalo? Aye. Advances and repayments? <coughs> so moved. Second. Any discussion? 
Ms. Kikowski? Aye. Mr. Caleb? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Requisitions? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Kikowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Mr. Caleb? Aye. Travel expenses? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Kikowski? Aye. Mr. Caleb? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Bills? So moved. Second. Discussion? <coughs> Ms. Kikowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Mr. Caleb? Aye. Uh, authorize various personnel actions as indicated on the summary sheet for employees within the jurisdiction of the Lorraine County Board of Commissioners. Uh, uh, commission. Commissioners, I have a, a couple of uh, uh, requests for hires from Job County <laughs> Services, so we'll need a brief session at the conclusion of our regular board meeting. <coughs> okay. Uh, number 10, renew the 2006 Corsa and issue a warrant in the amount of and $811,380 to Corsa for the years 2006 through 2007 benefit year. So moved. I'll second with a notation that this is an increase of $47,324 over last year. I'd like Mr. Cordes to explain, um, you know, our budgets have been frozen for many years and we, this is another uh, instance where we do pick up some some of the pe other department's budgets and he can explain that i appreciate that commissioner i sent you all a little note on that and we've been uh, periodically taking somewhat of a beating from a lot of the departments around the county because of uh, restricting budgets and and holding down uh increase in the budget uh similar to uh health care and uh, utilities and fleet gas and maintenance and workman's comp well the workers comp we didn't we haven't picked up yet this year but we have every other year this year was a little bit different uh, they they were, they were uh, pushed into a position to absorb that within their budget as uh, Commissioner Kalo was fond of reminding me uh, uh, I'm still on the hook for a couple million dollars in the red in our budget that I asked that you pass and we're halfway there but uh, I'm starting to feel the water rising on the other half. Uh, I'll get you a snorkel. Well, I appreciate that. I'm going to hold his head under water. I was thinking of like uh, what a guy. something to uh, hook to his ankle. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. I can feel the love. Just teasing. Uh, I, uh, but, you know, our insurance went up this year, $50,000, uh, due to two primary uh, issues. One was the detention home and the other was the county home because of the way they're reevaluating the liability with those facilities. Now, the county home, which is in desperately struggling right now, and we've been over that, um, uh, will pay theirs back to indirect cost uh, over time. Uh, we'll pick up the uh, remaining responsibility for the detention home as a general fund department. And uh, even if it's only half, that's an additional $25,000 that we, we have to pay out of the general fund. A lot of times these general fund departments don't see these increases. They don't see the gas bills going up, the electric bills, the, the, the uh, fleet maintenance vehicle uh, bills, insurance bills. Our insurance, I believe that bill was, what, a couple hundred thousand dollars. And, and uh, we're absorbing all of those increased costs. Last year we absorbed $625,000 for health care for the general fund. The commissioners picked up that tab for all general fund departments. And then they turn around and they they kind of give you guys a bad time because you don't give them increases. Well, if you extrapolate all of these costs over their departments, you'll see that all these departments' costs are rising on average, you know, a percent and a half to three percent, depending on the size and how much square footage they occupy. So while we're holding down the actual dollar of what we give them in salary budgets and equipment budgets, we're, we're, we're definitely passing increases on to them by, in the form of picking up their, their bills, that if we did full cost or full absorption accounting, we would actually put that money into their department and then transfer it back. Everybody would get a certain amount of utilities money and then we would transfer it back. And if they didn't have enough to make up their, uh, their share, they would have to find it someplace else in their budget. Mm -hmm. We don't do the full cost, full absorption accounting here. Uh, mainly because years ago th there wasn't really the sophistication in the systems here to do that. But if you ever went to that model, you would see just how much money the commissioners have picked up over, over the last few years for these general fund departments. 
and I, I don't know that they really understand it, and they do. They don't want to understand it, and they definitely don't appreciate it. Uh, so this is just another one of those. And I don't want to speak too long, but thank you for that opportunity because it's an important issue as we struggle through the rest of this year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further discussion? Ms. Kikowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. <clears throat> Number 11, authorize various locations for Lorain County pu public employee discounts. Cedar Point tickets will be $31.50 versus $39.95 for adults and $9.95 for juniors and seniors, 62 and older. Children 2 and under are free. These tickets will, will be also available for the Hallow Weekends. Soak City, tickets $23 versus $28. Geauga Lake, tickets will be $20 versus $24.95 for adult and $9.95 for juniors and seniors, 62 and older. Children 2 and under are free. Cleveland Metro Park, Park Zoo, Rainforest, tickets will be $8 versus $9 for ages 12 years and older and $3 versus $4 for ages 2 through 11 years. Employees can purchase tickets in the purchasing department by money order, certified check. No cash will be taken, and also family and friends of the Lorraine County Community Alliance and all county agencies, board members. Um, so moved. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Kikowski? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Okay. Number 12, award contract to Safe Air Contractors Incorporated and Mentor in the amount of $30,549.47 for the removal remediation of asbestos for the Lorain County Transportation Center. 80% will be paid by ODOT and 20% will be paid from a construction account. Issue notice to proceed letter on or before March 24th and complete honor before May 15th. Authorize the county administrator to notify county auditor to release retainage at the completion of said project. So moved. I'll second with one question. Um, obviously, we can't start honor before March 24th. Does that extend the completion date? Yeah, those dates should have been updated. We had some issues with, with this, so uh, we'll, we'll modify them. Um, I, I believe that we're not going to be done by, by May 15th. What I would like to do is just uh, scratch the dates and to be put two to be determined in there. Uh, Issue notice to proceed, right. uh, letter of uh, completion to be determined. Correct. Is that okay with you as the mover, Lori? That's fine. And it's okay with me as the second. This, this is a, this will get us going on the train station. I mean, this Can't is hear. <laughs> Sorry, the motion was modified. Issue notice to proceed letter, uh, completion date to be determined. This, uh, this has been a uh, <clears throat> start again, stop again issue. We're trying to figure out how to use these funds. But this is, this is going to be the first real work at the Transportation Center. So hopefully we got all the hurdles done. Every time we thought we were there, something came up with the way we were using the funds. So I think we have it all under control now, and hopefully we'll be moving very, very rapidly on our Transportation Center over the next year and a half. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Any more discussion? Ms. Kikowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. Okay, number 13, retain JP Incorporated Amherst to perform asbestos management, oversight, and ear monitoring testing for Lorraine County in the amount not to exceed $6,500 to be paid from professional services account. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Kukowski? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. Ms. Blair? Yes, but where is this? It's a management for the train station. Well, it's, it's, I assume it's, that. It's train it's, station and record center. And record center, both facilities. We were down in some of the 
crawl spaces uh, looking um, underneath the old stages and stuff, and we have some asbestos issues down there that need to be taken care of. So this will be like an oversight so we don't run into any, any hurdles later on. And Commissioner sure Cahill, the testing done in the air quality. And yeah. Commissioner Cahill has a lot of experience with yes, this. Was he down there crawling with you? Uh, I think he's past his crawling days. <laughs> yeah, past my crawling uh, days. He just sends me in and uh, says, is it okay to you know, okay. look in there? So so breathe those, heavy, Jim. Yeah. Those two, two projects, correct? <laughs> train station and the record center uh, correct thank you all right under job and family services number 14 approve and enter into purchase of service agreements with various vendors for summer camp experiences for low-income Lorain County children using the TANF funds authorized director of Lorain County job and family services to execute on behalf of the board Number one is Common Ground in Oberlin, Ohio, for 180 camp placements at Earth Camp in the amount of $28,800, effective June 19 of 2006 through July 28 of 2006 for six weeks. Number two, Horizon Activity Center in North Olmsted, Ohio, for 390 camp placements at eight Lorain County sites in the amount of $299,520, effective through July 21st of 2006. Number three, Little Lighthouse Learning Center in Lorain, Ohio, for 20 camp placements in the amount of $36,300, effective June 12th of 2006 through August 25th of 2006. And number four, Boys and Girls Clubs of Lorain County in o Oberlin, Ohio, for 68 camp placements at four Lorain County sites in the amount of $122,094, effective June 19, 2006, through August 25 of 2006. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, Jim, on this issue with the Job and Family Services, uh, received a phone call from Jacqueline Morales at Linden School where I, uh, they had the same concern that the l little lighthouse had where they had been awarded and then not given or whatever degree that was. They've got 24 yes. that they had applied for and I spoke to Jacqueline Morales there yesterday and want to follow up with you later today on this to see what's left or because I know there's a lot of funds in TANF that aren't being used statewide, a couple hundred million dollars laying around. So. It's uh, I, I received a similar call. I have not uh, returned to a call. I requested and do have on my desk the complete RFPs and packages that were submitted by each vendor to take okay. a look at what her concerns were. And I've had dialogue with Ms. Golsky. The Little White House we were able to re resolve successfully, uh, but the, the other proposer vendor, uh, they weren't uh, as... Uh, they, did, they lack the ability to provide funding based upon their submission at this time. I know the state has a lot of money, but we don't. And, okay. and uh, I'm going to look over the paperwork to write extra material to be sent over before I return the call, and I'd be happy to look over it with you after the meeting real That's quickly. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to get back with her on that. We could. I spoke to her yesterday on it. We had a good discussion. but I, I'm sure that they, they have a worthy program, and I'm, and I'm sure that they want to provide those services. But once again, the amount of dollars available programmatically for each part of, of what we can spend on is, is limited. Uh, but uh, why don't we take a look at the RP okay. and we can call from there. Okay. Right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any further discussion? Ms. Kukowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. Okay, number 15, approve and enter into a purchase of service renewal agreement with Diversified Transportation Services of Toledo, Ohio in amount not to exceed $202,000 to provide medical transportation for low-income Lorain County residents effective July 1, 2006 through June 30th of 2007. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Um, Kukowski? Oh, Betty? I do have a question. Um, number 15 and 16 are similar, but I think we need to, to just state why they're different. One is a renewal and the other is for a different service. All right, Diversified Transportation has been providing those services with Job Family Services for a number of years, very successfully. But if you read number 16, mm -hmm. it's also for medical transportation services for low-income <coughs> residents. <coughs> I read them both. It's for a different service. Is there somebody yes. here? I, I just yeah, there always is somebody here from Job Family Services. Thank you. It just needs to be clarified. Um, thank you. 
Doug Becker with Job and Family Services. Good morning. Thank you, Doug. Uh, clarification, we have three contracts with uh, three separate providers for medical transportation. Item 15 is with Diversified. Item 16, we're requesting RFPs for the other two contracts. One is currently with LCT, and the other is with uh, Life, care. Life Care Ambulance. Right. So that's the... Uh, and, I'm, and I'm certain that LT, LCT will continue to provide an excellent service. Well, I'm sure they will. <laughs> <laughs> we better hope so. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Ms. Kikowski? <clears throat> Aye. Mr. Caleb? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Okay, number 16, instruct the clerk to advertise requests for proposals for medical transportation services for low-income Lorain County residents. Notice will be published in the Morning Journal on April 24th and May 1st, and to be opened at 2 p.m. on May 8th in the Commissioner's Spec Conference Room. So moved. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> Ms. Kikowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Mr. Cable? Aye. Number 17, instruct the clerk to advertise request for proposals for computer programming and training project to the provision of access data programming services Notice will be published in the Chronicle Telegram on April 24th and May 1st to be opened at 2 p.m. on May 9th in the Commissioner's Hearing Room. So moved. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> Ms. Kikowski? Aye. Mr. Cable? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Under Solid Waste Management District, uh, number 18, allocate $15,000 for a litter pickup program in cooperation with the Lorain County Solid Waste Management District and Lorain County Engineer to be paid from plan implementation account. The funds will provide for seasonal workers, a van and maintenance, safety equipment and training. <coughs> so moved. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Kikowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. Under Engineer number 19, award contract to Kokosing Materials, Fredericktown, Ohio, in the amount of 256,256 thousand five hundred twenty seven dollars and fifty cents for asphalt materials for Lorain County Highway Department three bids were received on April 11th and will be paid 100 percent with MVGT from the supplies and materials account so moved second any discussion Ms. Kikowski? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. <coughs> Under Sanitary Engineer number 20, instruct the clerk to advertise for bids for the Broadway Avenue Taylor Streets Sanitary Sewer Project number 114 in Amherst Township. The notice to be published in the Morning Journal on May 15 and 22 of 2006. A pre-bid meeting on May 26 will be held and bids to be opened at 2 p.m. on June 14 in the Commissioner's Public Hearing Room. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Kikowski? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Mr. Kalo? Aye. Mr. Cordes, County Administrator? Commissioners, uh, Rob Johnson is here from uh, Johnson Aviation and uh, he has uh, some good news about the airport and I've asked that he come in tell you that in person good morning good morning everyone for those of you here that don't know who I am <laughs> I'm Rob Johnston and I'm the president of Johnston Aviation and also the um, business business development person assigned by the uh, airport authority to work on business projects for the development of Lorain County Airport and our facilities <clears throat> Um, I just uh, would take a, a couple minutes here to kind of bring you up to date on what's been going on. As most of you know, uh, Johnston Aviation was assigned with the task of managing the airport facilities by the, uh, the airport authority, and we began our operations actually April 1st. I'm happy to report that everything's running smoothly. We're converting from snow plowing to grass cutting and flower planting. And uh, we're also in the process of working through uh, several new mandates that have come down through the FAA and the TSA regarding airport and infrastructure safety for, uh, for the county and for the region. Um, our representative to the state government and also to the FAA 
uh, Doug McConnell, who is uh, my partner in Johnston Aviation. Doug uh, attended the state airport board meeting this past week, and uh, again, I'm happy to report that the airport is up to snuff. We're doing the things that we need to do, and we will continue to, to monitor the progress of our, our FAA safety program and our TSA initiative, and uh, we'll keep you informed on the progress there. Um, I'm also happy to report that we're uh, launching an advertising in initiative uh, in the next couple weeks to advertise our flight school and our flight services that are available through our service center for Cessna aircraft and Cessna flight training. Uh, this is also a college level program and protocol that is, is attracting family type um, investment in children that are going to become pilots of the future. This is not just going to be what has typically been in, in, in regional airports, uh, your kind of weekend flyers and your country club uh, businessmen flyers. This is uh, really uh, a community involvement that uh, is, has been long coming for Lorain County and our company has been doing everything in its power to attract new, uh, new talent to the area and to the airport. Um, we also uh, are affiliated with two national colleges that actually offer a complete aviation degree, which includes your, your ratings all, all the way through a commercial airline pilot. So I'm very excited about that. You'll be seeing uh, some of the advertising on the lo local cable networks. There'll be also some print media that will be, uh, that will be coming out shortly. And uh, I will again keep you posted on the progress there. And I might just digress for a second. Uh, <laughs> this is... Uh, kind of a new forum for us to be able to come to the board and sort of report to you what we're doing. And I really do appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you and answer any questions you might have as I go through this short list. Um, and, and I'm almost done. Um, but this is something I would like to do routinely. Uh, you know, and if time permits and, and you will uh, permit me to do so, I'd like to sort of come maybe monthly and just give you a little update on what we're doing, what things are happening out there. Of course, in coordination with the airport authority, which is, is basically our boss. Um, ultimately, though, you are, and I, I do understand that. Um, I'm also happy to report that we, we completed uh, just about down to the final few words that need to be clarified, a, uh, a, a project for a lease arrangement with the board, the, the uh, airport board, to begin our hangar expansion project, which is going to result in, hopefully by the end of 2007, at, at, at the very latest, a, uh, a hangar project that will include uh, 12 new T-hangers to be sold as condominiums to investors and or businesses. That will allow us to expand our operations in the FBO, which is currently sort of crowded with small airplanes, and we're beginning to mix in some jet aircraft that uh, we need to have a little bit more room for to service properly. So I'm very excited to tell you that we actually have about eight candidates right now that are telling us they are going to build, build a product with us. So I'll, I'll keep you posted on that also. Uh, we are working with Rebecca Jones in the Community Development Department on uh, providing some assistance to get the infrastructure and also some job credits because these, these hangars will bring more airplanes and more people to the airport that, were, that are going to contribute to the community's economy, the county's economy, rather. Um, <clears throat> last but not least, though, my effort in the last six months has been really to try to, to get Lorain County Airport converted from a, basically a country flying airport to a more commercial uh, operation, which is involved in, in more than just weekend flying. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to report that our company has secured two major contracts with jet operators that will result in the addition of, of, of personnel and jobs up to probably about 25 over the next two years that, that, that are going to be involved in working on aircraft and also flying them. We uh, secured a contract with the Dolan Group <clears throat> from San Antonio, Texas and West Hampton, New Jersey, and the reason they selected our airport is because we're about in the middle, and we're going to crew and maintain their aircraft here at Lorraine, and we'll be going around the country moving their people around and also building a charter business using their aircraft. 
Also, and this is very exciting news for the county, um, we secured a contract with the Spitzer Group of Lorraine County here this past uh, couple days. We just signed the contract uh, Tuesday. And uh, I'm very happy to report that we are going to be managing the Spitzer Group uh, Lear 45, providing pilots and transportation support for their group and their corporation. And we'll also be um, developing charter business that will originate right here at Lorraine County for the region. And that will include Cleveland companies, Toledo companies, Akron, you name it. If you want to go somewhere, we can take you there. So with that, I will conclude, and thank you for your time today. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. That was absolutely wonderful. That's more information in 10 minutes than I received in the last 15 months, Mr. Johnston. <laughs> I'd like to know what they're doing. It's nice to see the Spitzer Group was on. I was speaking with Tony Giardini a couple weeks ago and told me you guys were in negotiations for that. Yes. Is the Dolan Group any part of the Cleveland Indians ball team? No, it's not. Okay. No, it's not. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a cement. Uh, their primary business is actually a, a patented process for uh, cement wall construction that is used. They call them lifted walls. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but they actually manufacture walls in a, in a patented process, then they lift them up and, and build a building out of them. Uh, fascinating group of people, and I'm actually looking forward to bringing, uh, bringing their president, Mike Dolan, here to meet us uh, in, in group. Uh, we have some ideas that, that might trickle over into other things that the county's trying to do at the airport. They might be able to assist us, because they're, um, they're very serious about investment in, uh, in regional airports and in regional commerce. They're already involved to some degree in doing that in the Texas and, and uh, New Jersey areas, as well as the rest of the country. I, I think they put the walls up for uh, that company that went over by the old hills in Amherst. Um, Cloverdale? Yeah. I think they did the walls for Cloverdale, those. They, they, uh, they oh, come okay. fully, fully concrete assembled and they mm -hmm. yes. left them into place. So, uh, like quite, Lego quite blocks. Process. Pretty mm -hmm. much, big Lego blocks. <laughs> big ones. Uh, Commissioners, you can see that we, we've made a bit of a seamless transition uh, to the professional management company that's been brought in to uh, work at the airport. We're still working out some bumps and grinds and how things are going to be done, but uh, uh, we didn't come to a total collapse. The place didn't shut down. The lights didn't go off, and, and uh, things are going well. You're, you're going to be receiving more and more information about what goes on at the airport, and I appreciate your comment, Commissioner Kalo. Uh, I think that we we've always been behind the scene, behind on getting the news and what's going on at the airport and getting the events and things that that are uh, shaping out there. And, and we want to make sure that that doesn't occur anymore uh, as we continue to progress out there. There's there's a number of of things that uh, the people out there are working on. There's a number of things that you know, we're going to be bringing to the board, and we can do simple things to support the airport like our, our transit company that we, we contract with, they have to rent space for where they store the buses and where they do maintenance on the buses. There's no reason why uh, we can't have a spec building built out there and then rent it to that company because they do have to lease space for all that as part of our RFP. There's ways for us to support us, mm -hmm. okay, uh, if we just you know think very deeply about what we're doing. Because in that RFP for transit, we can simply put that we'll provide the facility, here's the rent for the facility, and they got to incorporate that into their bid, their bid and their planning mm -hmm. document. And there's no reason why we couldn't have transit, and I don't mean their administrative headquarters because we're going to have the transportation center, but of course their maintenance mm -hmm. uh, and advertising and, and those spaces. There's no reason why we can't work on that industrial park out there at the airport, just be put a spec building out there and be our first building. There's, there's a lot of ideas out there, and what we got to do is explore the possibilities. Well, I think just the openness and people seeing what's happening out there, Rob, you coming here and telling people you can see on TV what we're actually doing and what's getting done out there through the airport authority. People know what's going on because I think the airport has just been for so long an entity into itself. Now people can see what's happening and going on out there and, you know, as long as you're working well with the city of Oberlin as you talk about the commercial expansion and such like that. And I'm sure Shirley could talk about that. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well, let me be specific about I don't mean that Continental Airlines is going to start flying in and out here. Uh, and, and Wouldn't be are, a bad idea, though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I also think it's a good idea that you are working with our community development department. I yes. think that's an excellent idea. They've been very helpful, and uh, <clears throat> we, we have found some uh, some very uh, in, intriguing uh, uh, potential for 
further business development. I mean, I, I could go on, and I, I know you have to get on with your business, but we are beginning to get attention as an airport operation from business development and from people that want to do aviation business related items such as electronics. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge movement right now going on in the conversion of all the old aircraft and all the old aircraft systems to, to the new computer-based flight management systems is what we call them. That's a technical term. Basically, it's a computer in the cockpit. It's only this big instead of what you see on your desk. And it literally tells you everything that's going on with the airplane. We have, uh, and, and I won't get too deep into that, but we, we also have the support companies that go around, as I mentioned, the Cessna Service Center, the engine manufacturers, jet support is a, is, a, is a big item because those people are looking for regional bases. So we are actually talking to some, some companies that are interested in putting facilities here at Lorraine. Um, it sort of feeds on itself once it gets going. Uh, it's, it's really a, a good thing for the future for the county. And we already have a lot of the skills available from companies that have been here for a long time, just in the people that are, that are, that are already trained to do a lot of these things. So I'm very excited about it. Thank you, Rob. I Thank was just speaking much. to someone yesterday to take off on the flight school mm -hmm. that not only people wanting to be pilots, but also somebody that wants to be an air traffic controller yes. would have to get their pilot's license in order to become. So are correct. you getting a lot of that at the yes, school Yes, we also? are. We've, we've had a, actually a rush on that because, as everyone knows, the, uh, the controller shortage still continues to be a problem nationally. Yeah. Um, and we, we are right in the middle of that. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. I, I, I tried to think of as many things as I could. I know my three minutes is way, way up, but uh, those are the kind of things we're looking for. Those are the kind of opportunities. You're not locked in by three minutes. You're under my business. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I look forward to coming and speaking with you more. And of course, anytime you have questions, I, I believe you all know how to get a hold of me. And anyone in the, in the room that has any questions, I'll, I'll be around for a little while yet. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. I will be bringing forward uh, within the next week or two a proposal to um, to uh, do some financing. The hangar project is moving real well out there. It's a real nice project. Um, I have some photos and information I'll pass to the board at that time. Um, and once again, this is not going to be a, uh, a handout of cash. It's going to be a hand up because it'll be a loan that'll be repaid uh, to the county. So, Are we going to utilize the Port Authority on that? Or? Most likely, given the size of the, of the funding involved, it's it's not practical for a port authority. No. Any, you know, it's, it's going to sound it's going to sound strange, but anything under a million dollars is very very difficult to do financing for. Because of the cost. Uh, because mm -hmm. of the cost of issuance mm -hmm. out of the port authority, uh, more than likely we'll have to figure a way of doing that with the, with the general fund. But again, <coughs> this is money that will come back to us. It's not it's not a giveaway. Not okay. uh, but I'll be presenting you with that information, and then we can we can talk more. Uh, in, in this forum here about uh, whether you want to move that way or how we can move differently. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Shirley. Uh, Shirley R. Johnson Oberlin. This was very interesting to hear this report, and I hope we'll continue to have them, as he's indicated. Uh, we do, uh, with this increase in charter, jet service, and other businesses out there, we do need to be concerned or be informed on a regular basis of any increase in noise and changes in flight patterns in that area, because uh, you know that there have been questions raised, not just in Oberlin, but for those that live around the airport. David Ashenhurst, also of Oberlin, and I echo everybody's comments. This was a very informative briefing, and I would just say uh, at at the city of Oberlin, since we have uh, economic development activity that uh, both ties in with the county's overall uh, economic development planning, but as uh, home to the Joint Vocational School, home to some uh, uh, light industrial uh, areas that uh, are actually changing in uh, or potentially changing given the the closure of the Ford plant and stuff, there's questions about what some of those facilities will be used for over time. And I hope uh, that this information not only is presented at, uh, at meetings like this, but to the extent that there are briefings and written materials that can be easily shared with, uh, with other city officials in Oberlin as well as uh, 
by encouraging them to watch the, uh, the commissioners meeting on our cable. Um, I hope that continues to come and I would also say, and I don't normally speak for the city of Oberlin in these things, but I would say that a meeting, a briefing of city council in Oberlin can certainly be arranged as well as, a, as a, an adjacent jurisdiction to the township where the airport is and having both interests in flight plan changes and, and traffic changes, but also in the economic development activities as, as a place that close by has some other economic development <coughs> activities, which I'm sure would like to be uh, uh, coordinated. And all of that is under the rubric also of uh, encouraging regional governance as well as uh, acknowledging regional government next week. Thanks. Oberlin really doesn't have any idea of monopolizing these kinds of questions or comments and so on. So I'm embarrassed to say that I am Elizabeth Romanks, also from Oberlin, Ohio. <laughs> um, when Mr. Barth was first hired I, and when the airport was talking about expansion and so on, a lot of people at Oberlin were very concerned and I frankly was rather negative, to put it mildly, on the whole uh, aspect at that particular time. I would just like to say today, however, that much of what Mr. Johnston is able to describe, and which does indeed sound very positive and interesting, had been discussed, developed, considered, and so forth while Mr. Barth was still there. Apparently their working relationships were excellent. Uh, the back and forthing of professional knowledge, ideas, and so on seems to have been excellent. And therefore I think that however uh, the situation now is Mr. Barth deserves a certain amount of credit for this also. That's an enlightening comment, but I don't think Mr. Barth had anything to do with it. Uh, so I hate to uh, be contrary to your position, but uh, I think Johnston Aviation did it, and I don't think Mr. Barth was part of that process. Uh, Rob, if you want to, what's your position on that? Well, I'm going to put him on the spot. You made the statement, Elizabeth. I didn't. Well, I'm going to clarify the issue now. Mm -hmm. Lucky I understand this was your, your undertaking to Johnston Aviation. That is correct. Okay. Um, and just one other, just to clarify that, that is correct. One other comment that I would make, though, about the concern of Again, commercial operations, we, we, that's a very broad category. What that means in aviation is that we're actually paying people to fly us around. Recreational flying, which is primarily what's been going on at Lorraine the last 15 years, is where you just buy an airplane and you go out there and fly it yourself. Or you fly your family or your friends. You don't charge them. In fact, you're not allowed to charge them. It's, a, it's illegal, according to the FAA regulations. The types of aircraft that we're talking about using more of at Lorraine are the types of aircraft that are being used there now. Many of you may know, or if you don't, let me enlighten you, that we have a couple of foundation customers here that, are, that have businesses right here in Oberlin, in Vermilion, Birmingham Township, people like Betcher Industries. Very fine company. Uh, Mr. Betcher and his group have supported the airport and they've used the airport as a business tool to develop the industry that they're in. And I'm talking about nationally. That aircraft that they use is a Lear 31. The 45 and the 60 are very similar. They're slightly larger. They have, they have some range capabilities that the others don't. They make about the same amount of noise that a jet makes. We're not talking about changing the traffic pattern. We're not talking about doing anything different than is already approved by both the county, the cities, and the FAA. So let me make that very clear. This expansion is not, we're just going to throw the doors open and anybody can do anything they want. This is, this is an environment that is extremely sensitive and we are very sensitive to your concerns. So I, I welcome them and I will respond to any of them. Thank you again, Rob, for Thank clarifying. You. Thank you very much. Uh, commissioners, additionally, uh, Mr. Twining has some news that he would like to share with you this morning also. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Ron Twining, and I probably have less than three minutes, but uh, we just received a uh, 
noticed this morning from the Department or Federal Department of Commerce that um, Beckett in North Ridgeville has been awarded and established as a foreign trade zone. We've been working on that. The application for the designation had been granted, but they've held the appropriate public hearings and everything, and they have officially signed off. I've given that to the, uh, the commissioners, the clerk, and the uh, media here today, the notification that Beckett is now established as a foreign trade zone. Thank you, Ron. Nice work. Well, we continue to make progress on a, on a lot of fronts, Commissioners. Uh, <coughs> that'll conclude any reports I have this morning. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Clitton. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ennis? Um, I don't have anything to report other than next week. Uh, I have a pretrial on one of the cases that we have pending, and it's at the same time as the Commissioner's meeting. So if you have any issues that you need to have answered before that meeting, uh, let me give me a heads up before then. Okay. Do you mean you're not going to be here? Well, for at least part of the meeting. Okay. okay. Commissioner's report? I do have a couple of things. Well, Monday was tax day. Um, those of us living in Lorraine and working in Elyria, we had to pay an, a little additional money. So just to let everyone know, there is a form that you can fill out um, through our payroll department. It's Lorraine County City Tax Authorization Form so that they will take the correct amount out of your paycheck so you won't end up uh, paying more at the end of the year. Uh, the second thing, on Tuesday I went and visited and toured the Vocational Guidance Center. It's a nonprofit organization that provides evaluation, vocational training, work experience, and job placement services for people with disabilities and economic disadvantages. Um, it was a really eye-opening tour they do a lot of a lot of good things there um, they have about 25 between 25 and 35 employees at any given time and they subcontract to different employers uh, throughout our area um, so it, it was it was a very nice tour and then yesterday I had the opportunity to uh, take a tour and have lunch at the Lorraine Senior Center and they pretty much rely on bingo to to fund their operating expenses. They have um, 11 staff members that work 25 hours a week. They're desperate, uh, desperately looking for, for money and they're also looking for some transportation because they do go to the seniors' homes to pick them up and take them uh, to doctor's appointments, um, hospital, beauty shop, grocery store, those types of things. So if there's anybody out there in the community that has a, a van that they, they want to get rid of, or if they have any cash that they'd like to donate to the Lorraine Senior Center, they definitely appreciate it. They have a lot of great things, woodworking, um, computer training, dancing, exercise, all kinds of things out there. And the um, cost for membership is was $5, and they increased it to 7 So they get a lot of nice services for, for their members. And they, at this time, they have about 420, with uh, 80 of them being active. So keep them in mind. Thank you. They do a very nice job at the Senior do. Center in Lorraine. Uh, not too much happening this week, but can you tell us what happened at the train station yesterday, Mr. Cordes? It was a regular uh, episode from COPS uh, yesterday. Uh, my understanding is that uh, we found, well, a lot of people may not be aware that uh, somebody tried to burn our building down about a week ago, and uh, they were, you know, we were joking that we wish they were successful, but. <laughs> we seen this mess is abatement. Uh, uh, Did you uh, pay them to set that fire? <laughs> <laughs> no, Commissioner, I didn't, but okay. I should have thought about it. The, the, uh, it uh, we had a break in about two weeks ago, and it was, uh, because the building is still in a, um, a demolition condition it really wasn't a big deal but there was a lot of vandalism within within the building a lot of graffiti and uh, there was definitely some attempts at uh, possibly some arson or even worse within within the building we we did the investigation we made the reports and we just did what we had to do from there but I, yesterday uh, some of our maintenance guys were going past the building and they observed some disturbing activity and they called the uh, for some law enforcement, my understanding is they found several juveniles uh, actively in the engaged in destruction within the building. And in fact, I, there was some guns drawn and some uh, some uh, difficult uh, uh, detainees. 
uh, were, were uh, taken into custody uh, by the Illyria PD. So I don't know where it's going from there. I'm not sure that this is the same group that was in the building um, you know, last week, but it probably is. It's probably the same uh, group of people that have nothing better to do. Uh, but because they're juveniles, we really can't go much further with, with that. But they were they were definitely mid-teens, most of them. There was one that was 12, though, right. that right. was there. So uh, we're going to have to do something once we start the renovation of the building to provide for additional um, uh, fortification on some of the access points to that building. Thankfully, we were not uh, too involved where there's been any destruction that lost the taxpayers any money. In fact, some of the areas they helped us out. On. Yeah, they kind of helped us out in <laughs> the demo. So, so it really wasn't a total total loss. Uh, but it's the, a shame, though. The potential of Austin and things like that, you know, all joking aside, was was rather spooky uh, for us, uh, especially now when we start the renovations. It's going to be a very difficult renovation because it's a historical renovation, and any damage once we start doing the work will be you know very very costly. But uh, yeah, it was, I guess they had quite an excitement yesterday. Yeah, I guess, well, the Elyria Police Department, our Sheriff's Department, thank you very much for getting that taken care of yesterday. One more report. Uh, what is the protocol for our buildings that are inside the corporate limits of Elyria? I think the Sheriff's Department is called first. We, we did call the Sheriff's Department and... Uh, Elyria responded first. Right, they, they had some activity they were involved with and uh, they allowed us to go with Elyria and Elyria responded to shortly thereafter. The reason I ask that is because I had the pleasure of visiting with Lorain County Sheriff deputies last evening, and that was one of the issues that we discussed, and the fact that those are road deputies that respond inside the corporate limits of the city of Valeria. So we need to be looking at how many road deputies there are and what they do for us besides patrol the township areas. Just put my plug in for that. Well, they have my a, turn? They have an important yes, it job. Is. Yes, they do. It's your turn. Thank you. A uh, little fun first and then a serious item. Uh, while you were having lunch at Lorraine Senior Center, I, we were down in Wellington at the Red Hat luncheon at the uh, First Congregational Church. And it was very interesting because everybody there had a red hat on, but uh, the program was put on by Janet Bird from the Lorraine County Historical Society. And she had hats from 1860 through the 1950s. And she had a couple models of the ladies from the group. And the history about hats was very interesting. And it corresponded a lot with the history of our country. And I didn't know that there was um, so much dollars that went into hats. At one point, she said it was the second most expensive household item. Second most expensive household item was a hat wow. or hats. Aren't you glad we don't wear too many of them anymore? Mm -hmm. And then the other. Some uh, of us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was her, wondering how many of those hats you had in your closet at home, Commissioner. Uh, at one time, I had about 40 of them. <laughs> uh, they don't have feathers anymore. But there was uh, an issue uh, several years ago about the importation of feathers on birds and stuff, and they passed the law uh, constitutionally because of um, animal rights, because they were killing these birds to... Make put feathers. them on hats and stuff. So it was really very interesting. So anyway, we had a little fun at lunchtime. It was a very nice, and they're going to have another luncheon in October, so I'm, I hope they have as interesting a speaker. So that was the fun part. The other part is, and I, um, Rebecca is here from the Alliance, so she's going to tell us a little bit about our Lorain County Transportation Day, uh, which is coming up. Uh, and I saw David uh, having a, a heart attack. You can't talk yet, Rebecca, until oh. I'm done. You can stand there, but I want to get my plug in first. Uh, in conjunction of County Government Week, which talked about our affiliation with all the various political subdivisions, Lori and I are going to be at the uh, Community College on Friday, um, April 28th, for Lorraine County Transportation Day. And we're going to have uh, several interesting speakers uh, from the various departments. And one of the presentations, and I have a copy for each of the major newspapers, I'd like you to take this with you and look at it a little bit. It's uh, West Shore Greenway. It's a presentation from um, Neotrans Consultancy, uh, which is Ken Prendergast, who is uh, very interested in rail. And it's not uh, flight, but it's the other component. It's the rail. And this is a proposal for the West Shore Greenway Regional Passenger Rail Service. We've talked about commuter rail between Cleveland and Lorain County ad nauseum.
this is a proposal to, in fact, put it into practice. So Ken is going to make an official presentation on the 28th about this. Also, the Howe Rail Development Commission is going to be there, and uh, we're just going to talk about what's available in Lorain County. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, yes, as uh, Commissioner Blair mentioned, next um, Friday, April 28th, is the Lorain County Annual um, Transportation Day. We'll have the Ohio Rail Development Commission there, the Ohio Department of Transportation, the Northeast Ohio Area-wide Coordinating Agency, and Lorain County Engineer's Office. So we'll have local, state, national um, planners all at one, um, one point, so it's always very informative and well attended, and we look forward to it. Um, the second point I wanted to bring up is that our website is now up. We're at www lccommunityalliance.com. Community We've got agendas and meeting um, announcements on the site. And lastly, just briefly, we're excited to announce that the, um, the 10th anniversary celebration luncheon will be held here at the administration building on June the 2nd, and more information will be forthcoming. <laughs> we hope. We're coming. <coughs> you better be ready. If not, we're going to have a picnic on the floor. Just where are you eating at? On the floor. Well, in case it's not on the floor, where were you anticipating eating at? In your new meeting room? In your office, Jim. <laughs> Rebecca said your tables. office. Contrary to popular opinion and public publicity, it's not that big. Uh, the, I checked with Miss Davis and she said that it will be ready. She works for you. It's on her head. <laughs> right. I said if it's not ready, we'll just go out in the park and eat. Well, I just, uh, it'll be a flying launching to our new facilities. We'll make it happen for you, Commissioner Blair. Mm -hmm. Yes, I thought it was a great idea. I knew you'd be happy about it. Uh, you got a better chance of making that budget balancing at this project done by June 2nd. Uh, well, I'm, I, I, I'm a little concerned, but uh, I understand you have some tools still from your days when you used to do that stuff. So you and I will have to come in here in the evening. And, uh, <laughs> there you go. Evenings and weekends, we'll get it done. I thought you weren't crawling on the floor anymore. Uh, when you have to, you have to. Do All sure. right. Sort of like when I'm begging for your vote. <laughs> <laughs> that concludes my report, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, any additional public comment? Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Commissioners. Mike Sherman, Lorain County AFL-CIO, on behalf of President Brian Baker. Decades of struggle by workers and their unions have resulted in significant improvements in working conditions. But the toll of workplace injuries, illnesses, and deaths remain enormous. Each year, more than 56,000 workers die from job site injuries and illnesses, and another 6 million are injured. Companies that repeatedly break safety laws, killing workers, face only weak penalties. Workplace standards are out of date and inadequate. Many long recognized hazards have not been addressed, and new workplace hazards that emerge get no attention. Ergonomic hazards still cripple and injured more workers than any other workplace hazard. Immigrant workers are being killed on the job in record numbers. Millions of workers have no protections under the Occupational Safe and Healthy Act. The first, uh, the unions of the AFL-CIO and the United Auto Workers remember these workers on April 28th, Workers' Memorial Day. The first Workers' Memorial Day was observed in 1989. Uh, April 28th was chosen because it is the anniversary of the Occupational Safe and Health Act Administration, OSHA. And the Day of Remembrance is a similar day in Canada. Every year, people in hundreds of communities and work sites recognize workers who have been killed or injured on the job. Trade unionists around the world now mark April 28th as an international day of mourning. Workplace injury and illness and death uh, do not discriminate between those that are represented by a union and those that aren't. We want to thank the uh, commissioners. Uh, number one, we understand there's some resolutions coming out next week in support of Workers Memorial Day they, as they have in the past. We also want to thank the commissioners for giving us the time and space. Uh, for those that don't know, on the north side of the old courthouse is the Workers Memorial Day uh, sandstone uh, memorial and a similar one sits out in front of uh, Lorraine City Hall. There's going to be uh, services uh, next Friday, April the 28th at 12 noon at the memorial in front of the old courthouse uh, uh, right here on the north side and at 3.30 p.m. 
in Lorraine in front of the Lorraine City Hall where the other memorial. And uh, I've left some uh, flyers at the back table. Again, thank the commissioners for their support by resolution and for uh, giving us the space and uh, uh, maintaining that monument. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's going to be a busy Friday. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a very busy Friday. Friday's great. Commissioners, we have a uh, we have a long and uh, warm tradition of partnering with local uh, unions on uh, that site over there. So I would encourage you, if you have a little bit of time, to to participate, and we will make sure that the site is prepared uh, properly for when they have their ceremony, as we as we do each year for them. Um, and that goes back. I think Herb Jacoby was the one that actually proposed that location for the yes, original memorial uh, some time ago. It's hard to believe that much time's gone by, Mike. I have some letters for you. Maybe you'll stop by my office. Uh, do you want to pick them up, Mike? Something I owe you? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Seeing none, I make a motion that we go into executive uh, session. Sure. We do oh. need to we want to move Just on the, the reading of the board oh, correspondence. Yeah. You waved. Did you make that motion? I'm trying to spit it out. <laughs> <Second>. <laughs> Okay, any discussion? Ms. Blair? Aye. Mr. Kelsey? Aye. Mr. Kaler? Aye. <laughs> now my motion still stands. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Ms. Kelsey? Aye. Mr. Kaler? Aye. Ms. Blair? Aye. Unless otherwise announced, meetings are held Thursday mornings at 9.30 at the Lorain County Administration Building. 226 Middle Avenue, 4th Floor, Downtown Elyria. These are public meetings, and as always, you are invited to attend. In 1992, the citizens of Colorado voted to change their state constitution by passing an amendment called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, or TABOR. It promised to cut government waste, make politicians accountable, and provide taxpayer refunds. If only the taxpayers of Colorado had been told about the fine print. I regret voting for TABOR. Coloradans, I think, were not fully aware of what they were voting on when they voted for TABOR. You know, usually when it looks too good to be true, it is too good to be true, and that's what's happened in Colorado. It sounds awesome. I get to vote on any new taxes. Why wouldn't I support it? And what I found is that there's a whole lot more to Tabor than that particular soundbite. And we all got suckered in. You may be wondering why you should care about what's happened to Colorado's schools, universities, health care, roads, and economy. After all, you don't live there. But Colorado is a case study of the harmful effects of Tabor, the so-called Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And with some politicians trying to bring it to your state, you should know what it's actually done to Colorado taxpayers in their state. Coloradans were told in 1992 when Tabor passed that what this guaranteed them was a right to vote on any and all tax increases. What the public didn't realize is that it would contain the strictest tax and spending limitation of any state in the country and long-term would hobble us economically. The problem with Tabor is that the formula was flawed. It was deeply flawed. Tabor's fine print reveals a rigid formula of inflation plus population growth that determines how much the state government can increase its spending from one year to the next. And here's why this formula doesn't work. Inflation is determined using the consumer price index, which is based on what a typical American buys. Think of it as a basket of goods that includes things like housing, cars, and food. But here's the problem. What consumers buy day to day is not the same as the basket of goods state government buys day to day. States must purchase things like education and health care, services that rise in price much faster than what the average person buys. So restricting a state's budget based on the increase of the consumer price index prevents states from keeping up with the rising cost of vital services making drastic cuts inevitable. Making matters worse is the second part of the Tabor formula, population growth. It's defined as the overall population change in a state from year to year. The problem here is that population growth doesn't factor in the subgroups of people with costly needs, like school children, the elderly, and the sick, groups that tend to grow more rapidly. 
For example, as the baby boom generation ages, the number of senior citizens in most states is rising faster than the general population, putting new burdens on state programs that help the elderly. So limiting state spending using overall population growth ignores the needs of groups like the elderly. As a Republican, I can tell you that, that Tabor will, will tie your hands. Brad Young served in the Colorado State Legislature for over a decade and was chairman of the state's budget committee. He's seen firsthand the devastating effects of Tabor and he's now writing a book, The Truth About Tabor. The formula of growth plus inflation doesn't keep up with the economy. What it does is it has an insidious uh, effect where it shrinks government every year, year after year after year after year after year. It's never small enough. The faulty formula is only one major problem with Tabor. Another major problem is that because it gets locked into a state's constitution, it is very rigid, leaving no flexibility for a state to respond to unexpected challenges. Once you've established a constitutional amendment, it's, almost in, it's just almost impossible to change it. In fact, since Tabor was added to the state constitution, Colorado has become one of the nation's poorest funded and poorest performing states. Colorado has fallen to 47th in K-12 education funding. The ratio of teacher salaries to average private sector earnings is the lowest in the nation. Child immunization rates are one of the lowest in the nation, and pension and reserve funds have been raided just to keep basic public services functioning. And then there are the promised taxpayer refunds that in years when Coloradans actually get them aren't really worth much. Tabor promises refunds to people, promises people that they'll get money in their pocket. And the reality in Colorado is that while you get a little bit of a check in some years, you end up paying so much more for schools, for roads, for tuition, and for health care. But there's no, it's an empty promise. There's no real new money for anybody. In fact, it's costing us more. Parents are paying for essential services that previously came out of school budgets. We pay for workbooks, we pay for paraprofessionals, we pay for reading um, paraprofessionals, art classes, music classes. You guys can either come or you can stay for When we got refunds, and we haven't gotten them for a few years, was around $200, $250 uh, for a, a married couple filing jointly. So shelling out $1,000 for schools per year is obviously, you know, I'm losing money. One year, we got $132 back. But when I'm having to pay $1,000 for my kids to do sports because of what isn't available any longer, it's not worth it. Christy Hargrove is a Republican and a small business owner. Tabor has made it impossible to keep up with um, the cost of education. We, our schools are suffering terribly. Her family lives in a small town some 500 miles from Denver. Her three kids attend the local high school where Tabor has literally had a chilling effect. The kids were freezing in school. It was ridiculous wearing down coats to school. And, um, you know, in some of the schools are wearing gloves, taking notes wearing gloves. And actually that's what got me involved. So I think we're going to have to really think about some more fundraisers this year. Christy says they've had to rely on the PTA, private donations, and a mill levy to keep their schools running, not to mention the heat. We have local um, fundraisers and property tax initiatives and things to pay locally for what the state used to pay for because there's no money. Our PTA here is buying all the textbooks for the school. We still have to pay back the $30,000 loan from our district fund drive from a year ago June. And in schools where parents can't afford the extra fees, education is being cut back even more. It's the constant humiliation of parents who perhaps can't afford to pay for basic things. It's not luxuries we're talking about. Our students are pitted one against the other for um, a piece of an ever-shrinking pie, and that's just not right. In considering a Tabor Amendment, does a few hundred dollars in refunds per year, is that going to offset dramatic increases in tuition. It won't work that way. Jay Hellman is the president of Colorado's Western State College. He's seen firsthand how Tabor has placed public higher education lower and lower on the priority list for funding. We've got a real backlog of controlled and deferred maintenance issues with our buildings. At our college, a small college, we are uh, we're about 13 million 
uh, behind in our ability to care for our facilities. The most important thing that governments can do to aid an economy are to invest in people, education, and workforce, and infrastructure. Tom Clark is the executive director of the Denver Metro Chamber, the largest business organization in the state. The biggest and, and most obvious uh, infrastructure that suffered have been roads and higher education. Uh, we're running, a, depending upon who you talk to, a 40 to 60 billion dollar deficit in road work that needs to be found somewhere and, and Tabor's made it impossible for us to get that money back into uh, projects. I think it definitely has a, an impact on safety in the community. 300,000 was actually paid by the community. Art Morales is the fire chief for Castle Rock, Colorado, population 35,000. He's had to freeze jobs at his fire station due to Tabor budget restrictions, putting his existing firefighter safety at risk as well as the safety of the growing community. We're providing more and more services just without extra people. There's really not an end in sight leaving Tabor intact. Tabor is marketed as a way to cut government waste, but in reality it has ended up costing taxpayers more through increased fees for everything from fishing licenses and court filing fees to contractor fees that get passed on to new homeowners. Rancher John Singletary says the water regulatory agency in Colorado has gotten so broke that they've turned into a primarily fee-funded agency. When they come and inspect our wells or do our, any uh, services that, that regulate our water process here, they charge enormous fees, maybe up three, four hundred percent over what they were prior to this Tabor. And Singletary says Tabor's created a funding drought for Colorado's Ag Department. The Colorado Department of Agriculture has no money to help the farmer in research and, and in, in infested areas. We have different diseases that, that sometimes hit our livestock that we need help, assistance on and, and boy it's really difficult it's difficult to find that money has she ever had pneumonia before she's had one ear infection we had no idea what the true impact of Tabor would be when it was passed she stayed 20 days dr. Stephen Berman is the professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine Colorado has the most restrictive child health programs in the country Tabor has forced the state of Colorado to opt out of certain Medicaid programs, and the result is devastating to families like Kim Aboots, who has health care insurance but needs Medicaid because her daughter is severely disabled. I have been given basically three options, and those options were um, to institutionalize my daughter or to move to a, another state that w we wouldn't have a waiting list. Um, or to come up with the money, the funds on our own to pay for her supplies. Kim moved her family to Colorado last year in order to keep her job, and she never dreamed her daughter would be placed on a five-year waiting list for Medicaid. It's devastating for my daughter because her health is at stake. I would have thought twice, I would not have, we would not have moved if we would have known that we would have lost our Medicaid services. We would never have moved. Since Tabor, three-quarters of Colorado pediatricians won't treat Medicaid patients because reimbursement rates are so low. More poor children lack health insurance in Colorado than in any other state in the nation, and access to prenatal care has fallen dramatically. Dr. Mark Johnson works at a public health clinic in Jefferson County. We have had to cut programs in our substance abuse area. We've had to cut programs in our home health care, we have had to cut our prenatal program, and we have cut our primary care treatment programs. Tabor has definitely had an impact here. And on November 1st, 2005, after 12 years of Tabor, Colorado voters said, enough. They approved a measure to put Tabor on hold for the next five years to avoid further deterioration of state services. So learn from the experiences of Coloradans. If someone is trying to convince you to vote to put Tabor into your state's constitution, think about it. Think about what this rigid, unrealistic formula of inflation plus population growth could do to your state. And ask yourself, is it worth it? You have to be careful if someone's putting money in your pocket while your bridges are falling down. The things that you care about in your state will disappear. They will start crumbling. Your schools, your roads, Start closing your parks and your higher ed and have lousy highways. That's what you get with Tabor. It hits you everywhere. 
And it is a problem, and it's very apparent every day. It's not just something that's out there. It's in your life, it's in your face. Tabor threatens to be a long-term embarrassment to Colorado. My recommendation to other states is learn from the Colorado experience. Don't go down the road we traveled.